Welcome, everyone, to the fourth episode of The Right Side of Maybe, a podcast at Global Guessing where we talk to elite forecasters about some of their best forecasts and understand how they got to the right side of maybe before everyone else. In this week's episode, we are joined by Carolyn Meinel, the CTO of the Institute of Strategic and Innovative Technologies, a super forecaster, and a top 10 COVID forecaster for NIARPA competition that took place last year. Carolyn, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed watching Global Guessing. Yeah, it's so great to have you here. So in the first section of this podcast, we like to get to know our forecasters' background in the space. So where were you and how were you first introduced to the concept of quantified forecasting? Well, it began in 1992, and it was my mother who taught me. She had been going around giving lectures on solar power and with a lot of information about why we were likely to have an energy crisis and long lines at the gas stations and stuff. Well, some of my friends asked me to please publicize this by running as an indep- sort of an independent, we called ourselves a good neighbors union for the state legislature. And this started a lot of excitement because nobody believed with gasoline at 30 cents a gallon and very abundant frequent price wars at the gas stations in Southern Arizona. That just seemed like a, a ridiculous story. I even had a poster put out that predicted that by 1984, gasoline would be 85 cents a gallon. Well, not long after the election, and I actually got 21% of the vote carried by precinct, there hit the OPEC squeeze, and there were long lines, and it was 85 cents a gallon or so. And because I've been on television promoting this, I couldn't go walk down the street without people stopping their cars and say, Carolyn, Carolyn, how did you figure this out? And um, what sort of, was that like the moment where you understood that forecasting was this useful tool? And did that sort of start your journey in in terms of uh, taking it seriously to improve your forecasting skills? Right. I, in that particular case, I relied on a report by Chase Manhattan Bank that all the media was ignoring. But I realized that having many sources and understanding history was very important. Now, that was the first time that we had a big oil squeeze in the global markets, but things like that have happened with other markets in the past. So it really wasn't a huge jump of logic to realize that you can use different but similar events to forecast things that have never happened before, but that are really going to happen, like watching an egg on the way to the floor, which, by the way, when I was interviewed about that OPEC thing, I said, I saw an egg on the way to the floor and predicted that it would break. And so you you were just talking about, you know, using other events as a as a way of understanding, you know, other forecast and, you know, looking at different sources of information that others aren't looking at. Would you say that those were sort of two of the major things that you considered critical for your development of becoming a good forecaster? And if so, you know, what other skills do you think proved pivotal in terms of helping you become uh, a good forecaster early on? Uh, that's correct. Now, after that, I you wanted me to bring up the space thing. And I had a very interesting experience with putting out this magazine called the L5 News. We always told people L5 stands for Lagrangian Libration Point number five, as everyone knows. I told that to many reporters. (laughs) But I uncritically published many forecasts of continued drastic cuts in the cost of launching things into orbit. But as it happened, this was, I started this newsletter, which became a magazine. Now it's called Ad Astra. So it's been a very successful magazine in 
the space world. But it in 1975, when I started that newsletter, there had been a pretty steady improvement, first with aircraft and then with rockets. But then what happened was that both <coughs> with aircraft, they were predicting we'd have lots of supersonic passenger aircrafts and the supersonic flight was going to be a big deal, and we were going to have colonies in space in 10 years, all that stuff. Well, as it happened, everything slowed down, and the space shuttle actually increased the cost to orbit and did not help any with the reliability because about one in every 25 launches blew up, either launching or coming back in. So that was immensely instructive to me. And I was very glad that I kept a low profile in that magazine. I, uh, back then, if you were the staff of a newspaper, you didn't put individual bylines for the reporters so as to keep ego out of it. So I didn't get nailed for any bad forecasts back then. <laughs> Why do you think you, you got those questions wrong? You said you were uncritical. Uh, what, what do you think you missed there? Well, one of the things about base rates is if you look far enough back, you can find comparable technologies that they go into an exponential improvement and then they stagnate. And by the way, Something like that right now is happening with Moore's Law and computing. It's a big issue with researchers. And so what I did not consider in uncritically publishing other people's forecasts, they got their names on them, not me, was that at some point, these technologies, in particular with rockets, it's chemical reactions that get things into space. And even with the improvements now in cost, they aren't going exponentially better. It's still a matter of chemical reactions causing things to go from Earth to orbit. And we still don't have our, we only had one supersonic passenger plane and it uh, got terminated after it blew up. Um, that was the Concorde. So curious, just getting back to forecasting really quickly, um, how much time would you say that you spend forecasting every week? Um, is it something that, you know, you do in your personal life, uh, you know, to make decisions or maybe if not proper forecasting, do you use some of those like techniques or methodologies on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, yeah, well, right like now how do you I'm split having, up that time? Yeah. I'm having a very frustrating time right now, especially with uh, Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal and reading uh, Paul Krugman on the New York Times. Krugman predicted the crash of 2008 and the, New and the Wall Street Journal was spot on also about that. And that was easy for me to protect assets, et cetera. However, right now, the stock market has been bizarre. The bond market has been bizarre. You have things like non-fungible tokens, which one could argue are a scam. And I'm having a really hard time forecasting what I should do with my life savings. So this doesn't always work out. And I just cannot tell you what's going to happen now. It really concerns me when I am just flying blind for the first time in my life on the economy. I was always pretty good at seeing this before. So how much time do you th are, are you spending right now trying to you know, forecast and try to gain some foresight um, right now into something that you think is quite uh, nebulous and un understanding? Well, I've been making spreadsheets and tracking the progress of unicorns, which are companies that according to the money it took to buy shares of private corporations that would 
be worth at least a billion dollars. And I'm seeing the same bubble all over the place. And it's been hard to predict when they go, when they do IPOs, some of them, they withdraw the IPO before doing it because they realize it won't fly. Uh, some do very badly. WeWork was a good example, something very hard to predict. And it, it's just, I, I've been putting a lot of time building a lot of spreadsheets, trying to figure out where is the signal and where is the, Netherlands tulip boom and crash. Um, and so, then <clears throat> just really quickly, so I mean, I think this is interesting um, and something that would probably be helpful to our listeners. You know, I think a lot of times people feel like they're you know engaging with the topic or a subject matter where they're flying blind or may not have a lot of information or insight into uh, what's going on. Are there other examples of times where you've been? Um, sort of bereft of information and are there like tips or tricks that you use to try and learn quickly or get an idea of what's going on and understanding of the ecosystem? Well, I'd like to use the cold red worm as an example where I was okay. spot on and early. <clears throat> In that case, I had two fabulous resources and they were totally disjunct from each other. One was a group of computer hackers, many of them well criminal hackers, Carolyn, they real quick, before a, we before we yeah. get into the code red forecast, I think it'd be yeah. useful to um, provide our listeners with um, background on ter in terms of what this forecast was, you know, what your prediction was, and um, how you uh, were forecasting as uh, the event that you were forecasting happened. You were you were writing up a forecast, and as you were doing this, uh, the event that you were predicting ended up coming true, which. Uh, we've had happen to us when we were forecasting the Suez Canal crisis. We talked about that with Peter Herford in the first episode of this podcast. So if you could just give our, our listeners a high-level overview of what the Code Red forecast uh, and how you approach the question and, and all of that background, because it's, it's, it's a really fascinating story. Okay, I'll give the uh, big reveal at the front. I was forecasting that a nation-state was going to harness internet worm technology, which previously all the worms had been attributable to some disaffected young man. And that instead, in this case, it would be weaponized. And indeed it happened. I sold Scientific Mer American on doing this story back in uh, it's either late April or early May. I couldn't find the email where I first pitched it. But at the time, I had seen evidence that in China, something was going on that was not random hackers and that they were experimenting with worms that infected various flavors of Linux web servers. What's a worm? Linux, um, okay, a worm is a computer program that uh, unlike a virus, a worm will uh, infect a computer and then it will generate more copies of itself and then it will send out these copies to other computers. Whereas a virus might just, you might put a floppy disk back in those days into your computer and the floppy disk would infect your computer. So having things traveling over the internet was uh, becoming more and more of an issue. Got it. And when you made these observations <clears throat> in, in China, what sorts of sources were you looking at to sort of determine those signals? Was it like open source um, sort of data that you were scouring or were there certain people that you would listen to who had knowledge of you know, the situation on the ground over there? Or how would you get that information? Well, the two sources I had was number one, I was doing some work for DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And as part of this, I was on a mailing list that was private and it included several epidemiologists to study human and animal disease transmission. And the theory was that software infective agents ought to have a lot in common with those that 
attack living organisms. The second source was also a, a private mailing list, and that was called Bug Track, B U G T R A Q. That list is no longer in existence. Back then, there was a combination of security researchers and computer criminals and just plain hobby hackers. And they would, they were pretty notorious because if someone discovered a way to break into some kind of computer, they would publish it on bug track along with the code. And then all of the guys who were on the criminal side would quickly rush out and commit computer crime. So they had a lot of enemies, enemies and they didn't like me either because I knew I was on the side of the feds. But what happened was they were analyzing what they called the lion worm, L01N. They figured out who were working on it in China. This was in early 2001, when in China, you didn't have many computer hackers in their mother's basements doing mischief. So my thought was that this is different from the guys that kept on writing worms that were like the Melissa worm. They, they'd say, oh, click on this link and you'll get to see porn. Uh, they were very amateurish. In the case of the lion worm, they, it was perfect for testing because the Linux operating system is actually a plethora of operating systems, all based upon the same type of kernel developed originally by Torvald Linus. So if you came up with a worm, you didn't have to worry about millions of copies and it getting a whole lot of attention. It might infect a few thousand at most, and then researchers could analyze how it operated. But my thought was once they really got a handle on these Linux worms, which by the way, they started doing in 1998, that was the first sign of these experimentations. The lion worm was the most sophisticated because it left a way to get back in and then install all sorts of horrible stuff. So I figured there was this huge Windows server ecosystem all running the same operating system and the same web server, millions, tens of millions of them all over the internet. And the federal government had decided for purposes of being well organized that they would all run federal web, web servers, even in the military on the same operating system and web server. So they were a sitting duck and I knew it. And I wanted to get the word out before it was too late. So I wasn't exactly thrilled that they lapped me. They, they got, first of all, a version of red, co red, red code, excuse me, code red for the web that had a major error. So it slowed down its propagation. It had to do with its uh, failing to properly seed its random number gener generator. But within hours, they put out a better version. And they did several other versions in rapid succession. So you could tell they had a whole lab working on this, quickly improving and observing. Yeah, in your, and, in your article in Scientific American, it quotes that over 360,000 servers were infected from the code red worm in less than 14 hours um, right off the bat. Um, that's a pretty large impact, yes. especially, especially back back in that age of the internet, right? Yes, and plus what it eventually got millions because first of all, it went, it infected, well, the whole federal government prevented most of its servers from getting infected by simply shutting down internet access. So you couldn't, well, for example, if you were running a barge on the Mississippi River, you were relying upon the Bureau of Reclamation, as I recall it was, to tell you where these constantly shifting sandbars were that day and hour. 
And all of a sudden, all the barge traffic had to stop because they didn't want to run aground on these sandbars. Wow, that definitely reminds you of some of the more recent cyber hacks that have happened uh, this past year. And I, I think we want to dive into that. But before we do that, I just want to kind of circle back to this forecast because it's so interesting. It seems like you sort of recognize that there was this 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 fat tail risk of vulnerability for the U.S. internet infrastructure that uh, a lot of people in the in the cybersecurity industry were ignoring. You were raising a flag um, about it as you were writing the article. The thing that you were forecasting happened, and then it seemed to abate by. And I w- I went back and I read some of the news that came out after your original piece. Uh, and some people were talking about how you sort of jump the gun and that the code red worm wasn't as big of a deal uh, as your article was making out to it. But then I think it was later that year or in 2002, code worm, uh, code red worm started up again and then infected into the millions of servers. Um, what do you think was sort of missing that other people just weren't weren't understanding when it came to the risk and how do you think that you saw through it? I mean, your post was both had foresight in the fact that you were writing it and then the code red worm happened, but then you also wrote about it. And then the code red worm came back with a, with a vengeance six months later. I mean, that's, that's kind of a a two for one foresight. Your forecast, your forecast had done. Well, also regarding the issue of exaggerating it, I think they were conflating what I wrote with, other people, most notoriously Richard Clark. And I uh, provided you with a copy of something I wrote in 2006, a post-mortem on how overreacting to Code Reb, led by Richard Clark, helped cause the uh, 9-11 attacks by Al-Qaeda because they had a, a, an inside informant inside Al-Qaeda, uh, Khalid Ibrahim. And Clark got him reposted to infiltrating the hacker world because he was concerned. He had been told by people in the cult of the dead cow and the loft that horrible, horrible, horrible things are going to happen to the internet if they didn't do something about it fast. So while their best spy on what um, Osama bin Laden was doing, as I recall, he had been the driver for Osama bin Laden, probably overheard a lot. He got uh, got to move to McLean, Virginia, I actually went and visited the house where he lived and chatted up his neighbors. But uh, they missed the big one, the toppling of the Twin Towers and the uh, attack on the Pentagon. So I wrote up a postmortem on all that stuff. And I have for you a, a, on that PDF I sent you the cover of the uh, Skeptical Inquirer that covered that. So again, it's like what I learned with looking at space technology back starting in 19. 19- 1975, you have to look at both the things that say, this is what the base rate tells us is going to happen versus, well, yeah, but does the base rate always continue in the same direction? And what other factors can happen? Uh, I believe that I've seen some about, well, in the research I've been participating with IARPA's focus program which has to do with evaluating counterfactuals. We found that it helps to advise people when they come up with their first forecast of what would happen if you change something in the uh, base rate. And uh, by the way, I should say in that case, we were forecasting bots, fighting bots in computer games. And they give us like say a hundred computer games for us to calculate a base rate from those and then they say all right now we take a bot that has never fought another bot before but you've seen a bunch of their games they fought with different bots and so you put these two bots head to head the first time 
And first of all, what are they likely to do when they fight? And then they say, and if we then have, and this is really cute, baby bot comes into the room and tells daddy bot to play this different card in goose spiel card game that makes it harder for him to win, okay? And what, what they were successful at is saying, okay, make your first forecast, then try to heat up your forecast. In other words, try to say, well, maybe I'm being too conservative, heat it up. Then think of all the reasons to cool it down, all the reasons that, well, yeah, but daddy bot was really good at this, so it doesn't matter if baby bot made him play the wrong card. So that's something I learned from my forecasting and observing other for people's forecasting and space technology. You want to look at heating up your forecast. What would it take for it to continue to go exponential, like Moore's law with computing? Mm. So I'm curious. And then you want to think about cooling it down. What could cause it to, to go over the top and, and whoops. No, Some, nothing changed. Something that Clay and I and <clears throat> our friend Ross from AR Global Security have been talking about a lot is um, there have been a number of, you know, recent uh, ransomware attacks, hacks going on with some big companies. You mentioned like the solar winds attack, of course, which was a really big one. Um, there's also the hack on the Colonial Pipeline. And even just within the last 24 hours, there's um, a big meat, meat producer uh, called JBS that had a ransomware attack as well. Um, so clearly these attacks are, you know, happening more and more frequently, it seems at least, um, you know, are, I mean, one, I guess I'm curious as to your thoughts on, you know, the recent attacks that have been happening, but two, um, some of those same things you were just talking about in terms of what you observed that let you know about the code red worm attack, um, could some of those be applied today so we can try and mitigate, you know, some of the attacks that have been going on? Well, actually, yes, I've been following three crowdsourced, very successful companies that arrange for the federal government, other governments and private entities to pay computer hackers to reveal ways that their software can be exploited. And some of these hackers are making over a million dollars a year. Wow. You see what happened with the bug track list is they were just using it to promote crime, frankly. Mm. They shut down the list and they went commercial. And I know one of the guys, he was uh, he assisted me in my happy hacker organization, Dino Daisovi, did this big campaign about instead of having them try to get you busted and all this trouble, why don't you ask for money from the companies affected? by these vulnerabilities you find. And so now a lot of people and their managers are making a lot of money. Now, where I think modern forecasting technology could help is that this is all about computer hackers who are given a goal. Here's the software, here's this network. See if you can break in, see if you can do damage but don't actually do the damage, get to the brink of it and then tell us how to do it so we can replicate it. And then we send you a million dollars. And this really happens, okay? My thought is if you started scraping the dark web, which we'd have to have friends in Israel do the scraping because uh, uh, you have to steal passwords to do that. And that's legally questionable, but in Israel, we can get away with it. Okay, and perhaps there's a government entity at the US that takes advantage of it, but they can't tell the private world about this stuff because of the wall around the CIA and the NSA versus domestic stuff that's uh, legally mandated. But if you had ordinary non-hacker super forecasters or even ordinary forecasters, I believe there's an unlimited supply of potential super forecasters, by the way. Just turn a million people loose, and I bet they would find a lot of stuff like I did before it happened in time to protect these companies. Great. Um, 
Well, Carolyn, that is our questions on forecasting the code red. And so now we want to move forward to some final concluding questions, some advice for future forecasters, uh, and just talk about you know some of your forecasting habits. So I think the first question that we have, and we ask this to everyone that comes on this show, is what recommendations do you have for other forecasters, both nude and also experienced, skilled forecasters, who want to be more often on the right side of maybe, or to get there earlier and with the right confidence? Um, do you have books that you recommend, particular skill sets or habits that you find help you, you know, think better about um, the future? Okay. First of all, we found that one of the most dangerous problems for trying to be a forecaster is overconfidence. Now, I have often told myself I'd be, rather be hung for a sheep than a lamb when I realized I was being too cautious. But at the same time, I keep on reminding myself that I too can flub big time on my forecasts. What I've learned from myself and other super forecasters is that when you have a big flub, you just say, oh, a learning experience, how awesome. If you just keep on enjoying your mistakes, because the more mistakes you make, the faster you can learn, okay? Like with my experience running the L5 News and all these people forecasting what their next version of Rocket was going to accomplish, okay? So you want to be embracing your failures, but at the same time being enthusiastic and cheering yourself on. And as for reading, it's, well, I found the work of Kahneman and Tversky to be very helpful. I was fortunate enough to study it right after their first paper came out in, un, as an undergrad, and I'll tell you my age in a way, 1974. And actually I was, I'm old, even older than that, but. <laughs> It was fascinating to discover all the logical errors that people can make. And so it helped me to have a, a sense of looking inward all the time and saying, Carolyn, you're confabulating. By the way, the word confabulating is, uh, or confabulate is very valuable because one of the things that Kahneman and Tversky discovered is that people often don't know why they make decisions. Me too, I don't really know why. So I'll say, like, I'll forget something. And I'll think, oh, well, I had a good reason for forgetting. I would forgot on purpose. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but then I have to stop and say, am I confabulating, okay? I need to have a lesson learned when I make a boo-boo. Yes. So how's that? Yeah. So like on that point, you know, our colleague, Mikhail Dubrowski, he sort of coined this term minimal valuable forecast that there's, if you want to learn from a forecast, you have to put in a certain amount of effort into it in order to be able to learn afterwards. Um, if, if, if you just sort of quickly look at a question, think plus or minus from the community median, if you were to forecast on a platform like Good Judgment Open or Metaculus, you're probably not putting enough into a forecast to be able to learn from your mistakes. Uh, do you have a, a a sense of what sort of characteristics or what sort of um, actions uh, an ambitious forecaster should take so that when they make a forecast, they're putting in enough effort that it can be uh, something that they can learn from? Well, yes. We In fact, we have re research from IARPA's forecasting counterfactuals program, which is, first of all, concentrate on base rates. If you can look at either there's a history of the forecast itself, for example, the price of silver, or there's something comparable, like in the case of the code red worm, I was looking at the evolution of Linux worms. The next thing is to heat up your forecast. 
to think under what conditions might things be even more extreme than what I figured out for base rate. And then you think of cooling down your forecast. What could cause things like, for example, the cost of launching stuff into orbit to stop improving or even get worse as happened with the space shuttle. So you, you think about all the ways that the base rate might not apply or that the base rate needs to be cooled down. And if you do that, then, then there's one third thing. Okay, I really like Bayesian logic. And it helped me from being, prevented me from being underconfident. And the way Bayesian logic works, the way I'd picture it is you have an urn full of black and white marbles. You pull out the first marble, it's white. You pull out the second marble, it's white. Well, that's not enough to get an idea of whether it's all white marbles you pull out a third one, it's black. Then you pull out two more white. You think, well, it's mostly white. And you go continue with pulling out marbles. Well, they have found psychologically when people play this game of forecasting the ratio of white to black, that people are essentially always underconfident. And so what I tell myself is, is this like the urn with marbles? And if the key thing there is independent events, if you pull out one marble, okay, that means there's one less white marble in the urn, but there's like hundreds and thousands of marbles in the urn, so it doesn't really affect the total number. But if it's a dependent variable, like, well, if the price of silver yesterday was X, we know historically that it doesn't, except in the case long ago with the Bunker Brothers, it doesn't suddenly crash drastically. So, but on the other hand, you know that Bitcoin can go wildly up, and wildly down. So in the case of Bitcoin or because it always goes wildly up and down, you say that's not like pulling marbles out of the urn because that'd be like being given a different urn every time you pull a marble out. But if it is like pulling marbles out in our urn, something that's pretty stable, then go with what you've discovered early on and not be so worried that you're going to be wrong. Andrew, you're muted. By and the so way. I'm just curious, um, you know, in hacking, which you have a lot of experience in, one of the most important things um, that you can do. Uh, or one, I guess, role within the hacking ecosystem is pen testing. Um, yes. And I've been thinking about the analogy between, you know, if you think of a forecast as like a computer system and pen testing would be like that rigorous testing of that forecast to make sure, like to check its vulnerabilities um, and, you know, make sure that all of its le like levers, base rates are correct. Do you think that's like an apt analogy? And do you think it's an important thing to do to sort of quote unquote pen test your forecasts? Well, that's helpful, although I have some bad words to say about pen testing because you can't find everything from pen testing. There's two major approaches to finding vulnerability in software, and the pen testing is attacking it from the outside, which these three crowdsourced hacker-based organizations are doing. The other one is code analysis, where you look for known bad coding practices in the code. If you find spaghetti code, you might want to just throw the whole thing away. Gary uh, McGraw, under a DARPA contract, going on about in parallel with back when I was doing things for DARPA, developed some really great tools and they have much improved on how to do that. Let me see if I have a copy of this book right here. I think both code analysis and ah, 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 some ah. interesting approaches to auditing this, forecasts. This was revolutionary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gary McGraw, this is, book was produced out of Gary McGraw's DARPA work. And by the way, 
I found the typo. I, I found the only typo that he knew of that after I, nobody else had it. I found a missing curly bracket because I used to code. So it just jumped out at me. Oh, where's that curly bracket? Put it, it back in. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, Carolyn, do you have any other sort of recommendations for forecasters, resources that you recommend, obviously, besides subscribing to globalguessing.com? That's obviously the best way to get better at forecasting is to to read and engage with all of our content. But outside of that, any other tips for forecasters? Um, where can they find you and any exciting um, projects that uh, you're working on right now? Well... I tend to be kind of private on what I'm working on right now. Okay. okay. But I do occasionally. Well, right now I'm forecasting on Adam Grant's Think Again on Good Judgment Open. Think Again, I think, is the next best step after Kahneman and Tversky's Thinking Fast and Slow. And again, it's about not just thinking well, this popped into my head. It must be true. Thank you, QAnon, for that drop. Uh, <laughs> you have to be skeptical about your own thought processes while well, at the same time cheering yourself up because if you just beat yourself up, you're going to get depressed. You say, well, considering I'm only human, I'm pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can't recommend that book enough. Uh, I, I, I just finished reading Think Again, finally, uh, last night. And I think it's not only a really interesting book, but I found Adam Grant to be a very funny and engaging writer as well. Uh, a really good, really good book that uh, I'd recommend. Um, how, how are you liking the, the Good Judgment Open um, accompanying questions for it? Well, I think they're the cover of really wide range of questions so it'll give you a good workout on coming up with base rates i have been really amazed at some new forecasters there who have put up outstanding analyses in which they give both their sources and then say here's how i figured out the base rate etc so while you have the option of just finding who are the best forecasters by looking at people's Briar scores and their status on various leaderboards. If I find it's much better to look for people who posted something that included a URL, that's a good way of finding that they actually have used sources. So I'm, I'm delighted to see what I expect are going to be some really great super forecasters just joining in recently. Awesome. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on uh, the fourth episode of The Right Side of Maybe. If you guys want to follow Carolyn, she is on Twitter at C Minel. You can find a link to that in the description below. Andrew or Carolyn, anything else before we call this a show? Well, I think that's pretty good. I'm really yeah, glad you fun. read Think Again. Yeah, no, great book. Great book. Would yes. would love to have Adam Grant on the uh, podcast sometime. So if someone knows him, let him know that Global Guessing would love to have him on the show sometime. Well, I will let him know. Phenomenal. All right, okay. everyone. This was the fourth episode of The Right Side of Maybe. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Okay.